taking some questions today, responding to some uh, important objections that Muslims very often bring up. I do want to just head over to my channel just to make sure. Um, this says I'm live, but I'm a little I'm a little paranoid when it comes to stuff like this because uh, I have had people tell me that we're live and then um, they realize a couple minutes later we're not actually live. So like to double check on these things. And uh, Anthony, what are you thinking of the series so far while I uh, double check everything? Yeah, I think it's uh, great. Um, I'm really looking forward to future broadcasts, enjoying all the questions. Uh, hopefully we'll get some good Muslim interaction. We've, we've discussed a little bit the possibility of playing some clips from Muslims as well as not just Muslims who uh, are well known, who have videos online, but Muslims who want to challenge things we've said, uh, who want to send us video clips. Uh, and then there, I don't know if you saw the comments, somebody on the last video we did, uh, he, uh, the guy asked if you want to debate him one on one, and I responded, letting him know that I take care of all your light work. So, if he wants <laughs> yeah. to come to the show and debate, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, I, I saw that, and 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 then I glanced at his other comments, and I don't know why people who clearly don't know anything and haven't studied anything are some of the people who are most willing to debate and most eager to debate. I mean, it is isn't it shocking, right? I mean, if someone asked me to debate a topic and I had n clearly never studied it before. I had strong feelings about it, but I obviously I knew that I never studied it before. Uh, I wouldn't be eager to debate it at all. And yet we find out that our Muslim friends who, again, clearly, clearly have not read the Hadith, clearly have not read the Quran, clearly have not read the Bible, are nevertheless uh, pounding their chest and saying, face me, face me, no one's ever heard of me, I don't know anything, but come and face me. Uh, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> now, what, what's, what, what's, what's kind of sad is, when these same people go out and then actually spend several years studying and become knowledgeable, for some reason they're not as eager to debate anymore. It's, it's almost like, hey, what are you guys learning along the way there that makes you not as eager to debate as you once were when you didn't know what was in your sources? So, or else, after uh, uh, you know, overly eager Muslims do start to debate, when their moms see them, they tell them they can't debate anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure you catch the illusion there. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> and 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 it's funny too because these guys will run around on the internet and say, uh, "Debate me, debate me," and then when you're like, "No one's ever heard of you," you have you have no no base. Uh, no one cares what you say, and you clearly don't know anything. Why would I debate you? Then they run around and say, they're scared of me. These Christian <laughs> apologists are all terrified of me because of my awesome arguments. And so <laughs> eventually someone deba debates them, utterly demolishes them, and then Muslims come to us and say, why are you debating this person? He clearly, clearly doesn't know anything. You're, you're seeking out weak opponents to make Islam look bad. So there's really just no win here. If you refuse to face an amateur, uh, everyone says you're scared. If you face him and demolish him, everyone says you're picking on weak weak opponents. It's uh, there's just no winning here with uh, with Islam. All right. Well, uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is answering Islam live, where we will be fielding um, questions from a variety of sources, responding to them. And uh, the reason this is important is uh, the same issues tend to come up over and over again um, between Christians and Muslims. And so if you are exposed to these objections regularly and you are, you are exposed to the responses to these objections regularly, then you start, it starts to become second nature responding um, to the objections and having, having good answers to respond. And so we're going to... Um, go through uh, quite a few objections and questions as we go along here. And one thing we'll do is we, we are usually going to start with something from uh, one of our patrons. Anthony just started a Patreon campaign uh, two days ago because I told him, it, it, you know, if, if, you, um, if you start up a Patreon campaign, that might actually free up some time so you can focus more. Um, on doing things like this and making videos and so on. So 
Uh, that should be down in the description box, a link to his campaign that he, that he just started. So if you uh, want to help Anthony continue doing uh, apologetics here uh, on YouTube and doing a live stream, then jump on there, put in a, a dollar a month, two dollars a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. Uh, shouldn't be too much trouble for, for most people, but if enough people jump in there, then that helps people who would normally go on to become pastors or something like that, which is a noble, noble calling. But there are people, we do need apologists, and we do need them on the Internet, and we do need them on YouTube. So uh, the only way people can do that is if other people are taking care of them so that they can focus on this kind of thing. So I encourage everyone to jump on there and uh, and uh, chip in a dollar, two dollars, five dollars a month for Anthony so that uh, these can continue. Uh, so we, we do respond first to... Um, to questions that we have from patrons on Patreon. So if a patron, uh, patron sends us a question asking us something, wants us to respond, um, we're going to give that special attention because they're the ones making it possible for us to even do this in the first place. And so these are already people who are interested in apologetics because, um, well, they're, they're funding apologists. Uh, so we do want to answer questions from them. Then we want to answer um, any questions that we've we noticed from like the day before or the comments section from the day before that we didn't get to respond to. Uh, it's actually helpful if it's from the day before because then I can actually take a screenshot um, get it all, get it all queued up, and then we, won't, when we want to read the question, I can actually pull it, pull it right up. And uh, other than that, we'll respond to uh, questions and objections from uh, super chatters and from uh, just people in the chat room. We only have an hour, so it, it tends to go by very quickly once we start rolling. Um, but uh, I'm sure as we get the hang of this, we'll we'll be able to uh, to burn through. Um, to burn through these questions much more quickly. So we want to go ahead and get started. And the first one I have queued up here is about Surah 9, verse 29 uh, of the Quran. This came from uh, a patron named Ron. And Ron says uh, that Yasser Qadi says, so Ron is uh, talking about something Yasser Qadi claims, it says, Kadi says that Surah 9, verse 29, does not apply to today, and that it was only for those people of that day. Muhammad was trying to rid Mecca of the polytheists and gave them safe passage for four months to leave. This is evident by reading the beginning of the ninth chapter. Uh, he also claims that Jesus is alive and on earth today. This was said at his Let's Get to Know One Another meeting with James White. How would you respond to that statement? I liked how you used uh, his clips in your la latest series of Islamicize Me. Now, I'm a, I'm a bit hesitant to respond to what Qadi says here, because if Qadi said what you said that he said, um, I can wreak havoc on that. And um, I don't trust Yasser Qadi very much, but if he said what you just said right here, I vote. To keep in mind, I, I didn't watch the exchange between Yasser Qadi and James White. And the reason is, um, if I find out that something is just going to be um, one person saying whatever he wants without the other person responding, uh, there are other things I could be doing with my time. I'd rather watch, I, I'm more interested in things like debates and so on. Or, or if, I, if I just want to hear Yasser Qadi talking, he has, he has some awesome lecture series on, on YouTube where he goes through the entire uh, history of the life of Muhammad and so on. So I'd be interested in, in that sort of thing. Um, so I didn't watch it, but if he claimed, if Yasser Qadi claimed in there that the that Surah 929 is about Muhammad ridding the polytheists from Mecca, then I, I would not trust Yasser Qadi at all anymore. Because I understand when a Muslim, when an average Muslim on the street makes a claim like that and says, "Oh, Surah 9 verse 29, that's only about this, that's only for that time or something like that," um, when it's a Muslim who has studied the Muslim sources in and out, someone who knows the Muslim sources to the extent that Yasser Qadi knows them, if Yasser Qadi were to say something like that, I could only regard him as a deceiver because there's no way to justify that from the Muslim sources. Um, the, the most obvious point would be, if you're saying, if he was saying that Surah 9 verse 29 has to do with Muhammad ridding the polytheists from Mecca, one that makes no sense. If you read Surah 9, verse 29, it's referring to Jews and Christians. Surah 9, 29 is talking about Jews and Christians. 
and subjugating them, not, not necessarily expelling them, subjugating them and forcing them to pay you the jizya. And the very next verse of the Quran gives the justification for subjugating them, namely our belief that Jesus is the Son of God and the uh, belief that, that is ascribed to Jews there that Ezra is the Son of God, which no Jew has ever claimed that we're aware of. Um, that's the justification for violently subjugating us. So to claim that this simply refers to that particular time, it doesn't say anything in the text about that having to do just with that time. Um, this ha to, so to make that claim with no basis, I mean, the command is to those, oh, you who believe. It's to you who believe. That's Muslims. And so there would be multiple problems with this. One, this is talking about Jews and Christians, not polytheists. Um, two, if it was just for that time, then you have an, another problem here, namely that uh, the Quran claims to be clear in its commands. And if you're talking about fighting people and killing people, then you need to be very clear about whom you're talking about. And if Yasser Qadi is saying, oh, that was just for that time, well, other Muslims down through history didn't get that message. Why? Because it doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say, oh, and by the way, that's, for, that's just for this particular time. So, uh, that would be a massive problem. And, and for some reason, Muslims don't get this. So just, just use, uh, just use a, a, a different example here. Suppose Donald Trump comes out tomorrow and says, makes an announcement, we will fight those who believe in Allah. Well, there would be an international uproar because Donald Trump said, we must fight those who believe in Allah. Now, suppose that when people came to him, when the media objects and there are international outrageous riots and so on, suppose his response is, well, when I said we will fight those who believe in Allah, I'm only talking about a very small group. I'm only talking about ISIS and other terrorist groups and only until we stop them. And that's all I meant right there. Wouldn't everyone have a problem with that response? Wouldn't everyone say, come on now, if that's what you mean, that's what you should have said. If you mean, hey, fight these particular people who believe in Allah. If that's what you meant, then that's what you would have said. When you just give this blanket statement, fight those who, who believe in Allah, then you're opening the door for all kinds of violence. And if that's not what you intended, you need to be very specific about whom you mean, right? So no one would accept that as a response. But yet our Muslim friends tell us that when Allah says, fight those who believe not in Allah, and then goes on to specifically refer to Jews and Christians, what he really means is, well, I'm just talking about polytheists and only for a specific time, even though I didn't say any of that. So if that's what uh, Allah really meant, then Allah would be a horrible communicator and notice that would that would kind of be worse, right? If Allah really meant only fight specific people for a specific time, but it comes out fight all these people for all times with no 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 conditions there, then then you're dealing with a God who is just so hopelessly unclear that tons of people are going to get killed just because he can't say what he actually means. So we have all kinds of problems here with, uh, with that claim. Again, I would like to see what Kadi actually said. So, uh, Ron, if you want to pull up, um, pull up that video, find the spot where he says it, and send that to me, I'll be, I'll be glad to take a closer look at it. Again, if he did make that claim, um, I will have quite a bit more to say about that, especially if he was able to say that to a room full of Christians who might not know better. Um, Anthony, there was a next part to that, um, and that was... Uh, that Jesus is still alive and on earth. Now, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm familiar, what, explain what it, would mean, what, would it, what it would mean for Jesus to be alive, but I'm not sure what he would mean by on earth. What do you, what do you think that means there? Yeah, so it may be the case, and I, I don't know, it may be the case that the person heard Cadi make reference to the fact that Jesus is still alive and assumed that meant that he was saying Jesus is somewhere on earth today. There are certainly groups such as the Mormons who say that certain apostles didn't die and they're still running around somewhere on Earth. Uh, and you have, uh, of course, the Indiana Jones legend that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the apostles is alive somewhere guarding the Holy Grail or, or something like that. Um, but I suspect that what Cadi may have said is that Jesus is alive and didn't necessarily make reference to his location uh, because the Quran 
interpreted, I would say, in the way most Muslims have come to interpret it in Surah 4, 157, denies that Jesus was crucified and teaches a substitution theory that somebody was crucified in his place. But then in verse 158, it goes on to say what really happened with Jesus, namely he was taken up to Allah. And so the standard interpretation among Muslims is that Jesus wasn't crucified, but instead ascended into heaven alive. Now, that creates uh, certain problems uh, from a Quranic standpoint. In fact, let me just throw something in here. Uh, one of the comments on a previous video says that we worship a man as our God uh, whom the flies are buzzing around. And, and his point there was, and you, you, you know how Muslims are, uh, you know, have a fetish for all sorts of bodily discharges and, and that sort of thing. And so the idea that Jesus went to the bathroom and that sort of thing is supposed to be a disqualifier for the claim that he is he is God in the flesh. But that's just what you'd expect if he was God in the flesh. But obviously, as the resurrected Lord, Jesus has been glorified and uh, his mode of existence is distinctive now. Uh, he's incorruptible and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but he, so he makes this claim. And, and the reason I found that ironic is because. The Islamic Jesus, according to Muslims, is alive in heaven right now. But according to the Quran, a person is to pay zakat, for example, for as long as he lives. Uh, and Jesus, uh, I'm trying to think of the reference. Do you know what I'm thinking of here? It says uh, at one place in the Quran, it just dropped out of my mind. But at some, one place in the Quran, it talks about Jesus uh eating something as long as he lives or something along those lines. Anyways, I may have this... Uh, uh, confused, but the, but the point is that Jesus, if he never died, is still doing certain activities that the Quran says is permanent for people who continue to uh, live. So Jesus must be paying zakat in heaven. Yeah, and I, I actually uh, I brought that up in my uh, my last debate with Shabir Ali, and I didn't get a chance to respond to his response, but I thought it was silly. But I realized afterwards I never actually responded. But um, I brought that up, namely that if Jesus is still alive, and he says he's been. Uh, zakat has been enjoined on him as long as yes. he is alive, then the then he would still have to be paying zakat even now because he said it's as long as he's alive and he would still be alive and therefore he's paying zakat in heaven. But zakat is for you know things like the poor and jihad. So <laughs> so there are poor people and jihadis and so on in heaven. You know what's going on here? And Zakir Naik's response was um, was well you know but jesus isn't going to have any money or anything to to, to pay zakat from you know he, he won't be wealthy or anything like that in paradise and so the response obviously is if you look at the muslim sources you get lots of stuff in paradise right and jesus should be getting more than just about anyone and so jesus should be like decked out with all kinds of stuff so he should have all sorts of means to pay zakat with zakir Naik's, i mean uh, uh shabir ali sorry Shabir Ali's response was, uh, no, he just he's not going to have anything to pay zakat with uh, in paradise. So, sorry, Muslims, if you thought, you know, you're going to have all kinds of stuff in paradise. Turns out not to be true, uh, according to Shabir. Now, uh, all right. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I, um, I would. That's another instance where I would want to see what uh, Yasser Qadi actually said, because uh, <coughs> if he said that, then we're going to be a little confused because that is not standard Islamic belief. All right, let's go on to, uh, this is one that, that you noticed, and it's, it's addressed to me, but you can go ahead and respond to it, Anthony, since you wanted to respond to it. So he says, David, you criticize Islam and the Quran, but yet fail to see that the Bible was written by guys who never met Jesus. Explain to me how that makes sense, brother. And I'll just say, first of all, uh, even if the Bible were written by people who didn't know Jesus, it would still make sense to talk about the Quran, right? Th those are those are two different issues. You understand that? It's like saying, uh, David, why do you respond to this guy making all these kinds of false claims when the Bible wasn't written by eyewitnesses of Jesus? Well, those are two separate issues, right? You understand that those would be two separate issues. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what would you say in response to this, that the, that the Bible was written by guys who never met Jesus there, Tony. Yeah, well, as you were saying that, I, I was thinking it'd be like me telling you that you're on a sinking ship and then you responding to me and saying, oh, yeah, well, I'm okay because you're on a sinking ship as well. Yeah. Obviously, you're going down whether I'm on a sinking ship or not. Uh, so it doesn't do anything to refute the criticisms we make of Islam to allege that uh, people can make valid criticisms of Scripture. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but here, uh, the person, I think, is ultimately begging the question. Uh, he's assuming that the books weren't written by those they're attributed to. And I, I, you know, because he doesn't say too much, I have to think that what's behind this is a couple of assumptions that are pretty standard among unbelieving scholars and certainly are parroted by Muslims. And that is, first, that the, the New Testament writings were written much later uh, than we would say they were written. In fact, I, I would say that all of the New Testament writings were written prior to AD 70. And that's really an actually easy point to make. Uh, think, for example, of uh, you know, most, most scholars, I'm not saying I agree with this, but most scholars, even a lot of Christian scholars, would say that the order in which the canonical Gospels were written is Mark first, then Matthew, Luke, and after that, John. Well, interestingly, when you pick up the Gospel of John, there's clear evidence that it was written prior to AD 70. For example, if you look at John 5, verse 2, when John is writing about a miracle that Jesus performed in Jerusalem, he says there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, and he uses the present tense. Now, John's not writing to try and persuade people 2,000 years later that he's writing before AD 70, but, sorry about that. Uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> he, he, has, he has no interest in persuading, uh, you know, the, uh, Muslim scholars, uh, I better... Uh, Figure out how to stop that. Yeah, you uh, go ahead and you can mute that. Can I mute that? I don't well, know how I... that. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. Oh my goodness. It's what my daughter. For the record, she uh, just got out of a surgery. She's in Las Vegas. Anyways, um, so I told her to stop that. <laughs> Let's hope she reads the text. All right. Uh, Let's so slide on that one. But no, John's no, no, gospel next time. was written prior to AD seventy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the books of Matthew, or uh, the book of Luke was obviously written before AD 70 because it's the first of a two-part volume, which concludes in AD 62. The book of Acts in, in Acts 28 ends in AD 62. So obviously the first part of the book was written before that. Uh, but if Luke was written before AD 70, then so was Mark, which according to most scholars was uh, what one of the sources that Luke and Matthew were both using. And I could keep this up with the rest of the New Testament writings. Obviously, the writings of Paul were written before AD 70 because Paul was martyred before AD 70. Peter was martyred before AD 70. You know, and on and on it goes. And so it's, it's, it's a very quick and easy argument to, to show that uh, the, the, the books of the New Testament weren't written late, unless, of course, you assume they weren't written by those they're ascribed to. Now, here... Uh, part of the response would be that this assumes that many of the books, th that the authorship ascribed to them was something that came along later, just taking the four Gospels. When you look at the Gospels, you, you don't see the names of the authors. You know, Mark doesn't begin by saying, uh, this is the account of me, Mark, uh, and that sort of thing. But it completely overlooks that there is a superscription on every one of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. we, we discussed this the other day. Those superscriptions are not late editions. You know, most people think that they're kind of like the, the chapter headings that we have in our Bibles. The chapter headings aren't inspired. They're interpretations, they're guides, they're showing you what that portion of text is about. But they were added later by uh, translators and people who are uh, pr printing copies of the Bible for, for the uh, of the readers. Uh, but the superscriptions are not like that. The superscriptions are on all the manuscripts. There isn't a single manuscript that we have for any gospel at any place in the world, at any time, that has anything other than what we find on all the Gospels. Now, if these things were added later, then you wouldn't expect that kind of uniformity. And this has been pointed out by numerous scholars like Martin Hangel and so forth. If people were picking up these anonymous Gospels and adding names to them later, there would be different names being ascribed to them. Certainly, if you're picking a name out of the hat, or you're picking a name that would grant credibility to these writings, your first choice wouldn't be somebody like Mark. Your first choice would be um, someone like Peter. Now, uh, Mark, of course, is being written on the authority of Peter. Mark, uh, according to all the ancient traditions, was uh, writing based on Peter's preaching. Uh, but if, if people are just making up a name, why not just say it was written by Peter, mm -hmm. right? So that the fact that there's uniformity on all in all the manuscripts throughout the world, that the church was unanimous in uh receiving these books is from those that were 
they were ascribed to uh, speaks volumes. Now here the question becomes, or bringing it to the individual's objection, because he says they didn't meet Jesus. Well, Matthew and John were both apostles. They walked with Jesus. John, in fact, was part of Jesus' inner circle, uh, along with Peter and James, the brother of John. Uh, Matthew, of course, was one of the twelve. He was the, the tax collector uh, known as Levi in his gospel. Mark was a companion of Paul uh, and was also uh, referred to by Peter himself, one of the apostles, as his son in the faith. So Peter uh, receives the endorsement of both Paul and Peter. Uh, and then uh, Luke, of course, was a traveling companion of Paul. And, and in the favor of Paul and his testimony, I know Muslims uh, have... Uh, latched on to some of the later uh, stuff that uh, some people have, uh, you know, some people in liberal scholarship became accustomed to arguing that Paul was the real inventor of Christianity. That's really late in the game. The early Muslim sources don't make that sort of claim, mm -hmm. right? The early Muslim sources think of Paul as a righteous teacher and so on. But uh, a lot of Muslims would say that Paul was not a bona fide apostle of Christ, uh, but Paul receives the endorsement of Peter, as well as James in Acts 15, uh, and the other apostles. Uh, but in 2 Peter 3, Peter referred to Paul's writings as scripture. So the fact that Paul endorses both Mark and Luke, I mean, you just have multiple uh, lines uh, affirming the reliability of the witness of the people that wrote the canonical gospels, as well as the rest of the New mm -hmm. Testament. So the, the argument is flawed in, in quite a number of ways. Yeah, and, and really the... The, the reasoning behind the rejection of the traditional authors should be something that Muslims should not use, right? I mean, the, 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 the actual reasoning, the, the fundamental reason for denying the traditional authorship goes something like this. Jesus predicts the future in the Gospels. Jesus predicts the future in the Gospels, but we know that Jesus couldn't really predict the future. Therefore, those Gospels must have been after written after the events that Jesus predicted, in which case they must have been much, much later. And if they're much later, then they obviously weren't written by these original apostles, and therefore they're written by someone else. Now, why should that not be persuasive to a Muslim? Well, because if you're a Muslim, you have no problem. You have no problem with Jesus predicting the future. And if you have no problem with Jesus predicting the future, then you can just go along the lines of what Anthony said here. Uh, all, all the evidence we have tells us that these were early documents, um, written by eyewitnesses in the case of, of John and Matthew and of uh, at least traveling companions and eyewitness to, eyewitnesses to some of the events in the case of uh, Mark and Luke. So, uh, yeah, you're going to need a better case other than appealing to modern naturalist scholars who would deny the uh, the original authorship there. And even then, even then, even if you threw out the Gospels, yeah, we still got Paul, right? We still got Paul, and Paul certainly knew the eyewitnesses and went and verified his gospel uh, with the eyewitnesses. I uh, want to uh, thank the the uh, people in the super chat over here. Ricky Lee, thank you. Uh, didn't leave a comment. Um, who else do we have over here? Spot the Cat says, just testing how this works, but you fellows are doing a great job. Respect from the English Riviera. Thank you. This past one, John McDermott. Act 17 Apologetics. Uh, <laughs> Here, here's 10 pounds to humble these bad-mannered Muslims. Well, keep in, keep in mind, as far as bad manners, that th there, are ba there are people with bad manners on all sides here, right? There are bad-mannered Muslims and good-mannered Muslims. There are bad-mannered Christians and good-mannered and good -mannered Christians. Um, I would encourage everyone uh, who's good-mannered to ignore the bad-mannered ones. Obviously, if they're very bad-mannered, um, hope, the, uh, hope the moderators would send them off somewhere else. But... Uh, yeah, so it's not just a matter of bad-mannered Muslim people. The, these kinds of discussions can get very heated very, very quickly. So, And uh, it is disturbing that some people yep. tend to try to shut down conversations rather than... Uh, oh, hey, actually had a, there's a super chat here from a Muslim named God is Great. He said, hilarious how you want to dialogue with Muslims when your followers in chat do nothing but bash and attack us. Goodbye. Take this $5. Kafir. Now... This guy just called me. He just called us. He just called us Kaffers. <laughs> it's just like the nastiest insult you could call us. Uh, but uh, again, keep in mind, uh, Anthony, I don't feel like we're being bad mannered here. Yes, you might. You, there might be some uh, bad mannered, but Christians in the in the chat room. But 
I mean, we're on you're we're on YouTube live here. We're on YouTube live. Of course, you're going to get a, a mixture of people. So, uh, yes, my Muslim friend, if if you cannot handle um, much disagreement or even teasing or anything else like that or having your religion criticized, this probably would not be the correct group to be in right now. This is again, this is YouTube live. People can jump in if people cross too many lines and then they'll be blocked but uh yeah if you're if you're sensitive if you've got thin skin this is not a not not the right group for you all right uh anthony i wanted to go to a very important objection in terms of how many people there are who use this but we're going to take a look at jeremiah 8 8 so this came from francis uh, and the first comment was, God bless you, David and Anthony. I have a question. How can we respond to Muslims quoting Jeremiah 13, 13 as their proof text that the Bible is corrupt? And uh, Jeremiah 13, 13 is slightly relevant to a discussion, but there's a much more common one, which is Jeremiah 8, 8. And so I asked if he actually meant Jeremiah 8, 8. He said, I'm sorry, I meant Jeremiah 8, 8. Please advise many thanks. Um, and maybe maybe Jeremiah 13, 13 will come up in this discussion because someone, I'm, I'm assuming that someone had mentioned Jeremiah 13, 13 along with Jeremiah 8, 8 at some point. And he, 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 he brought up the 13, 13, not realizing Jeremiah 8, 8 was the objection there. But uh, Anthony, uh, what, what sort of objection would this be? Um, so what's the what's the Muslim objection here? Well, in uh, Jeremiah 8, 8, it says, How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. And so as Muslims read this, and there's actually a couple of ironies here, but as Muslims read this, Jeremiah is saying that the scribes have all actually falsely transcribed the law, so they have, in fact, falsified it uh, or corrupted it, which is what Muslims need to be the case in order to uh, rescue Muhammad from being a false prophet, since Muhammad claimed that he came uh, in, con in continuity with the previous prophets and the previous scriptures and that his message is continuous with theirs. And so if uh, we pick up the Bible and the Quran, we see the two contradict, and that uh, that means that the Bible then would have to be corrupted in order for Muhammad to actually be a prophet. And so the that's the reading that Muslims would, would put on this passage. But And I said there are a couple of ironies here. Uh, the, the first irony is, and, and we're going to prove this in, in a moment, but the first irony is that Muslims are actually guilty of misinterpreting this passage, which is what we're going to argue is what Jeremiah is saying the scribes were guilty of doing. They were misinterpreting the passage and putting out uh, false hopes to the people in the name of this is what the law of the Lord says. Oh, hold on, hold on. In other words, in other words, when you actually read this passage, Jeremiah 8, 8, and you read it in context, and you understand who who are the people who are being condemned here, it's people who are distorting the meaning of the Torah. And these are the people being condemned because they were distorting, misrepresenting Scripture to further their own agendas, and that people who do this stand condemned, and Muslims are appealing to this passage to further their own agendas, and they are distorting it in the process. That That's, that's the irony there? Yes. <laughs> and the second irony is that Muslims are charging the Old Testament scriptures, and they'd also make the claim for the New Testament, with corruption, and their proof is that the Bible says so. So the corrupt Bible uh, constitutes proof in what it says uh, that it's you know it's corrupted because it says so. But if it's corrupted, then how did the, yeah. I mean, how does the Bible become sufficient proof uh, for this charge if we can't trust that the Bible is actually? I mean, you can't appeal to Jeremiah, who's part of the the Old Testament scriptures, as proof if you think uh, things are corrupted, unless you could prove in some independent fashion that this verse somehow. Uh, manages, you know, to escape part, the whole corruption process. Yeah, and 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 by the way, I think you could actually use Jeremiah eight eight if it were claiming corruption to prove the opposite, right? Because keep in mind, if Jews felt free to change their scriptures, 
And there's this verse saying that their scriptures have been corrupted in their scriptures. Why wouldn't they have taken that out? Why wouldn't they have changed that, right? So, in other words, more than well over 2,000 years worth of Jewish scribes have kept that in there. And if it actually meant that their, that their text had been corrupted, you would expect them, uh-oh, people are on to us. They're on to us that we're corrupting our scriptures. Maybe we should be a little smarter here and not have this verse right here in the middle of our Bible saying that we're corrupting our scriptures. Maybe we should take that thing out. And so you would expect them to do that, but they don't. They faithfully preserve it. And so why? It seems like they're doing everything in their power to faithfully preserve their scripture. And if they're doing that, maybe we should want to take a closer look and see if this is actually claiming that the Torah has been corrupted. Now, what do you got? Yeah. Okay. So I thought you were going to add more. Um, I can, but I'll wait for you. Oh, okay. So you want me to get into the um, uh, evidence contextually? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and give people the basic idea of what's going on here, and then you we you can go to some of the text. So uh, a couple of important passages later in Jeremiah itself, um, Nehemiah, obviously, because they've still got the law then. And then I can talk about how if if Muslims are actually claiming that Jeremiah eight eight shows that the Torah has been corrupted, they've just refuted their own belief. But uh, just so everyone knows the the context of this passage here. In fact, let me let me let me go ahead and just read uh, the surrounding verses here. So we'll read the passage in context. So in Jeremiah chapter eight, um, starting in verse seven. We read, even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons, and the dove, the swift, and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. So the people don't know the requirements. Why is that? The Muslims will say, aha, because it's been corrupted. Verse 8, how can you say we are wise, for we have the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? The lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. So keep in mind, this is where this is the objection. If the scribes are the ones copying the Torah and they have a lying pen, well, that might mean that they've been corrupting the scripture and changing things. And if they've done that, well, then maybe we have a corrupted Torah. So that's the claim about 8.8. 8. Verse 9, the wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and trapped. Since they have rejected the word of the Lord, what kind of wisdom do they have? Now notice, they've rejected the word of the Lord. How are they rejecting the word of the Lord if it's already been corrupted? Something to think about. Verse 10, therefore I will give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners. This is referring to the judgment when the Babylonians are going to come and take over. And things are not going to go well there. So God says, I will give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners. They're going to be conquered. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. So here you have what's actually going on. And this is what's going on in the historical context of Jeremiah. In the Torah... God told the children of Israel, hey, these nations I'm driving out before you, don't think you're somehow just naturally more special than they are. If you do the same things that they did, I'll drive you out of the land too. So make sure you don't do the same things that they did, because I'll treat you the same way. Meanwhile, by the time you get to Jeremiah, the children of Israel have been doing all the same things that the pagans were, 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 were cast out of the land for. And so the prophet Jeremiah rises up and says, and guess what's going to happen? Exactly what God said was going to happen to you in the Torah. But you had false prophets among the people and false scribes. And the false prophets started telling the children of Israel, no, because you have the law. And because you have the temple, God is going to protect you. God is going to protect this place. He's never going to allow these pagans to come in and conquer you. You're going to be safe. That's why it said in the verse that we just read, they're saying peace, peace when there is no peace. Right? So what are these false prophets and false scribes doing? They're telling people that God promises to protect them no matter what they do. 
And so they regard Jeremiah as a false prophet for saying, no, God's coming to judge you just as he promised. So what are, what are the people who are giving out false revelations doing? The false prophets are making claims, and the false scribes are taking down these revelations about God promising to protect them no matter what they do, and delivering this as revelation. And that's what this passage is actually saying, and we know that's what this passage is saying, because as Anthony's going to show, the other scriptures show, the, the Torah has not been corrupted. But just imagine here, think about this. That's, that was the, the context of these false prophets. What were they doing? They're saying, no, God's just going to protect you no matter what you do. Is that what the Torah that we have today says? No, the Torah that we have today doesn't say that. The Torah that we have today says, God will cast you out of the land just like he cast those pagans out of the land before you, if you do the same things that they do. So did these people actually corrupt the Torah? No, they passed around fake revelations. And then when the children of Israel were judged and were cast out of the land, those prophets were recognized as false prophets. Their revelations were recognized as false revelations. They weren't passed on anymore, and they're lost. They're, they're forgotten by history because they were recognized as false prophets. So we all, just by examining the context and knowing the context here, this has nothing to do with the Torah being corrupted. It has to do with people making false prophecies and thus corrupting the message of Scripture. The message of Scripture was, God will judge you, but guess what? We still have that. We still have that. So, uh, Anthony, how can we know that the Torah itself wasn't uh, wasn't corrupted? Yeah, well, one of the best things you can get when you're looking for a proper interpretation of what a particular author has said, one of the best things you can get is the author himself saying something that, that clarifies uh, what, what was said previously. And so the question on the table is, was uh, were the scribes that Jeremiah is referring to falsely transcribing the law so that the law of God no longer was uh, something that was before the people that they could look to and follow and that God could hold them accountable to if they weren't obeying it? Or is he referring, as you said, to the lying uh, scribes of the false prophets uh, of Israel that were later judged and whose revelations ultimately perished? Well, when you turn to a passage like Jeremiah 26, you get a very clear answer. Same author, same book, he says in Jeremiah 26, verses 4 through 6, You will say to them, Thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, that is, the true prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and this city I will make a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, uh, there are several things going on here that, that uh, reinforce that Jeremiah is talking about the same thing that we were just reading about in Jeremiah 8. The, the larger context of Jeremiah 8 is it begins in chapter 7 and goes all the way up through chapter 10. And it's in a section where Israel is boasting in those blessings and privileges that they had from God, including especially the temple and the law. Uh, the temple was the place where God uh, said he was going to set his name, the place where Israel could turn when she rebelled against him, but was then seeking his forgiveness and uh, deliverance from his just wrath. Uh, so Israel had this false confidence that she could sin, uh, and it, it wouldn't matter. Nobody could come and, and attack her and, and prevail because she had God with her, as indicated by the presence of the temple and the possession of the law. And what Jeremiah is saying is, no, none of these things are any good if you don't uh, properly use them, right? If, if you're not going to the temple and actually worshiping God from the heart, but are going like hypocrites and, and just laying a sacrifice before God as if, uh, you know, it, it, all you have to do is slaughter an animal, uh, that doesn't please him at all. Uh, and by the same token, it doesn't matter if you have the law of the Lord but aren't keeping it because you're instead listening to lying scribes. I mean, it's no different than the Pharisees in the New Testament who were upbraided by Jesus, because uh, even though they had the Torah, they had the law, the entire Old Testament, uh, but they were more concerned with their own traditions. And so when you look at uh, Jeremiah 26, it's obvious that he's talking about the same reality, mm -hmm. because the last part of the verse, it says, I will make this house, he's referring to the temple, like Shiloh. Mm -hmm. The reference to Shiloh harkens back to an earlier time in Israel's history, before the temple was built, when the uh, tabernacle was located in Shiloh. But the people rebelled, and God judged them. And so the point Jeremiah is making is this house is not going to save you if you're not living 
for the God who gave you this temple, just like Israel wasn't spared back when the temple was in Shiloh. Shiloh was destroyed. So Jeremiah, but but here's the point. In, in verses 4 through 6, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me, to walk in my law which I have set before you. He hold, speaks, on, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, Anthony. Hold on, Anthony. Yeah, no, because I'm, I'm confused now. You, you just said that, that God, in Jeremiah 26, tells the children of Israel that They've got the law before them. Now, how is that? Tell me, how is that possible if the law has been corrupted? Well, that's the point. It's it's not possible. Uh, Jer- and so this is internal confirmation that Jeremiah is not making the point in, in chapter eight, verse eight, that the law itself had been destroyed. So, so in, and, in 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 other words, in other words, if you just look at, and this is what Muslims tend to tend to do when they interpret scripture, they go to something like Jeremiah eight eight, and it's talks about the lying pen of the scribes now does that mean that the lying pen of the scribes have uh, that, that the, the scribes have corrupted the Torah so that people no longer have the Torah they have a corrupt Torah or does it mean that they are delivering false revelations that are misleading people um, and are misleading people about what the Torah says because keep in mind most people aren't reading the Torah right they're, they're going to their religious leaders but if their religious leaders are coming out with false revelations from false prophets then people are getting a mistaken view of what they're promised in the Torah so the question is which one of those would it mean well Muslims go with the one they want to believe more which is oh your Bible's been corrupted and then they ignore the alternative interpretation when you're telling me, Anthony, that just by continuing to read the book of Jeremiah, they would see that the Torah itself has not been corrupted because it says later in the same book that God has laid it before them, that it's still before them. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was thinking there's an analogy here. Uh, think of the 7th century uh, after uh, the Lord ascended into heaven. Uh, 7th century, suppose you have these Jewish tribes living in a particular area and they have the, the Torah and the Old Testament writings as a whole, and somebody comes along, and he has scribes, and he's alleging that he's receiving revelations from God, and and his scribes are writing these things down. Uh, What would those scribes appropriately do if uh, that person was purveying false revelations? Well, they would say something similar to what you read in uh, Jeremiah. And, of course, I'm being somewhat facetious here. My point is, Muhammad is a a perfect match for what we're reading about here. Mm. Uh, He obviously wasn't Jewish, and this is all taking place in Israel, but uh, that's essentially what's going on. Other other people are arising, uh, purveying things as though from God that really aren't. Mm -hmm. And so, um, by the way, do we have elsewhere, after Jeremiah, still in the Old Testament, any indication that they still had the law, or did they regard the law... As corrupted, because I mean, keep in mind, Jeremiah. If Jeremiah is saying, if Jeremiah the prophet, who's regarded as a prophet, I mean, he's regarded as uh, uh, by Daniel as a prophet. He's regarded by everyone after him as a prophet. If Jeremiah had declared that the Torah has been corrupted by the scribes, and that's how it was understood by the Jews, um, then they shouldn't be appealing to the claim. They shouldn't be using the claim. They shouldn't be claiming that they had the Torah anymore. But uh, is that what they claimed? Uh, no, uh, and, and actually this uh, this is also, I think, ironic. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, you have Daniel making positive reference to the Torah, but, but here's how it begins. Uh, Daniel, remember, he's in exile in Babylon, but we're told that he was reading, of all people, the prophet Jeremiah, right? It says in the first year of, this is verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So Daniel, in exile in Babylon, says he was reading Jeremiah the prophet, and he saw in Jeremiah a clear demarcation of when Israel's desolations would come to an end, and uh, the specific number is 70 years. And he, but he goes on in the context to talk about uh, the law of Moses. And so I won't read the whole chapter, but starting in verse 11, it says, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So he's saying the same thing Jeremiah said. He's, he's explaining why Israel was sent into exile. And he's pleading with God to forgive Israel 
and deliver her back uh, into the promised land as Jeremiah had predicted. Mm -hmm. But he says, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written, is written, present tense, in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring uh, on us this great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity. So here's Daniel reflecting on Jeremiah and saying that Israel is in exile and isn't going to be delivered until the 70 years comes to an end, uh, precisely because they disobeyed the law of the Lord, which is with them, they still possess, and uh, so yeah, Daniel uh, confirms it, and I can uh, quickly add uh, the same positive reference is made in Ezra chapter 8 to the law of the Lord, and, and this is centuries after Jeremiah's prophesying. Uh, as well, uh, Malachi 4 makes positive reference uh, to the law of Moses. So throughout the Old Testament writings, I mean, just I'll read Malachi uh, 4 real quickly. In Malachi 4, verse 4, it says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Now, how can you remember it if you don't have it, if you haven't read it? Uh, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. All so right. you have the internal confirmation of Jeremiah. You have the repeated testimony of later prophets, Daniel, uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, Malachi. Uh, but actually, we could make this even worse and point out that the Lord Jesus in the New Testament continues to speak of the law as something that has not passed away, hasn't been corrupted, is still binding. In fact, Jesus said uh, his whole argument in many places in the New Testament hinged on the particular tense of a word or the whether a word was plural or singular and so on and so forth. I mean, you have the example in John 10 where, where Jesus says, uh, if he, uh, he's quoting Psalm 82, uh, and he says, the scriptures cannot be broken. He's, he's appealing to the fact that a specific word was used there, and, and if that word is not uh, something we can take as absolutely true, then the entire argument collapses, and, and Jesus' argument assumes that it can't be uh, falsified. So, Muslims would have to, uh, you know, engage in, you know, wholesale, dis, you know, dismissal of all. And of course, that's what they do. And I'll, I'll let you. I know where you're going, so I'll let you follow this up. But uh, yeah, uh, because uh, now think about this, right? So j just to sort of sum up here, um, if you if you take a claim like Jeremiah eight eight, and you want to know is Jeremiah saying that the Torah had been corrupted? Well, you can't ignore the fact that later in the same book, Jeremiah claims that the Torah has not been corrupted. So it, it's, I understand a Muslim who has never read the book of Jeremiah, has never read the Bible. He hears one of his Muslim apologists claim, uh, you know, that Jeremiah 8.8 8 undermines the, the, the reliability of the scripture. And he just goes with that. Um, for uh, Muslims who've actually studied, they should know better than this, right? In other words, once a Muslim has studied, the Bible and makes the same claim, then I have to start thinking that he's being deliberately deceptive, that he's not just doing this out of ignorance, he's actually being deceptive. And why? Well, if Jeremiah affirms later in Jeremiah that the Torah is still reliable, and the later, the, 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 the writers who come after Jeremiah affirm that the Torah is still reliable, and if you look at, the, if you look at what the Torah actually says, it's not what the false prophets were claiming that it said, and therefore they didn't succeed in corrupting the Torah. And then you get to Jesus, who confirms the Torah. And then finally, if Muslims want to say all of that is wrong, well, they have another problem, namely that not just according to the New Testament, according to the Quran itself, according to the Quran itself, Jesus affirmed the Torah. Let me give you, now, there are plenty of references here. Let me just read chapter, because time is almost up. Chapter 61, verse 6. And when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, surely I am the apostle of Allah to you, verifying that which is before me of the Torah, and giving good news of an apostle who will come after me, his name being Ahmed. Now, he refers here, verifying that which is before me of the Torah. And uh, that 
Muslims in the West will read that and say, oh, you see, it's just, he's just referring to something that came before him and was corrupted. That's not what it actually says in the Arabic. In the Arabic, it's actually, Baina yadehi, between his hands. Jesus verified the Torah between his hands. That's the Torah that was still around in his time. But wait a minute. If what Muslims are claiming about Jeremiah is correct, then the Torah had been corrupted for centuries. And yet Jesus is confirming the Torah that is with him in first century Israel. So if you Muslims believe that Jeremiah proves that the Torah has been corrupted, you've just called Jesus in the Quran a false prophet because Jesus in the Quran says that the Torah has not been corrupted. He affirms the Torah that was with him. But it gets worse because Allah himself Allah himself, in chapter 5, verse 43 of the Quran, um, the, the, the situation here is some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. Some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And Allah says, why do they need you, Muhammad? Why do they need you, Muhammad, when they have the Torah that is with them? So Allah says, Jews don't need Muhammad. They have the Torah. This makes no sense if the Torah has been corrupted. You'd run into all kinds of other problems, like Allah saying that he revealed the Torah and saying that no one can change his words. Chapter 18, verse 27, no one can change the words of Allah. So if you're telling me that the words of Allah have been changed and that Allah was wrong in chapter 5, verse 43, when he claimed that Jews don't need Muhammad because they still have the Torah, they, they, they don't have the Torah, according to what Muslims are telling us. And finally, Muhammad himself, in Sunan Abu Dawud 44:49, um, this is the historical background of that revelation in the Quran, where uh, they set up Muhammad as a judge, and there's a cushion that you would sit on as the judge of a dispute. You sit on this judgment cushion, and here's what happens. They set out a cushion for the Messenger of Allah, the Jews, and he sat on it. Then he said, bring me the Torah. Now, why would he be asking for the Torah if it's been corrupted? But he said, bring me the Torah. It was brought, and he took the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So Muhammad, in the 7th century, tells the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah. They bring him the Torah. He's on the judgment cushion. He takes the judgment cushion out from under him, sets the Torah on the judgment cushion, and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Would he say that about a book that was corrupted meant more than a thousand years earlier? If, so the answer is no. You wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that about a corrupt book. But Muhammad did say that. And so Muhammad has to be a false prophet because he affirmed as the authoritative word of God a scripture that our Muslim friends insist has been corrupted. So, if Muslims want to say that Jeremiah 8.8 shows that the Bible has been corrupted, the Torah has been corrupted, they've just called the Jesus of the Quran a false prophet, they've called Muhammad a false prophet, and Allah must be a false god, because Allah doesn't know that it's been corrupted. He's still telling Jews to judge by the Torah. So the, these, this is what happens, my Muslim friends, when you use these kind of arguments without actually understanding what the Bible says and what the Quran says. You run into all kinds of problems. Now, we spent a long time on that. We need to come up with a more condensed version because I'm sure there are many more Muslims who are going to show up um, using that in the future. So we need to be able to uh, respond, <laughs> respond to that quickly. But uh, we did want to go through all of it because, you know, that, that's a good question for someone who... Uh, is interacting with Muslims and who wants to know how to respond to them. And so if you take everything we just said and point that out to your Muslim friends, let me say this. If they go through all that and they still say that it's been corrupted, even though that would contradict what Jeremiah himself said, it would contradict what later authors said, it would contradict what Jesus said, it would contradict what the Quran says, it would contradict what Muhammad says, and they still want to go with that interpretation just because they feel good if they think that the Bible's been corrupted, you're not dealing with people who are actually honest there. Um, if, they're at, if you're actually dealing with people who have integrity, they're going to say, all right, I retract my objection. Um, so we're actually out of time. I did want to read one comment here uh, that I just saw. Pavli says, thanks, David. You helped me leave Islam and follow the truth of Christ. Well, well, I'm glad to see those. And that's interesting because I just I kind of glanced over at the at the chat here. I don't know how I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, we, we might need to take some days where we where all we do is focus on the chat. Um, because all kinds of interesting things might be happening over there in the chat, and uh, we might not be recognizing it. So we're actually out of time. Um, we will not be on this weekend, but we'll be back Monday. So we hope to see you there. 
We have uh, plenty more uh, questions and comments from people. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like to address, you can, you can uh, uh, become a patron. Uh, we'll be sure to get to those there. Or you can leave a comment just in the comments section of, of this video. And uh, we'll try to take ones that are, that are especially relevant. So uh, be sure to leave questions and comments, and we'll respond to them here on future episodes of Answering Islam Live. So see you next time.